Amen. Well, friends, our scripture lesson is from Romans chapter 12. Uh, We'll just be sharing verses 1 and 2. Uh, So let's share God's word together. And the Apostle Paul writes, So, and so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to our great God. Well, a young man had got his driver's permit, and he asked his father, you know, he wanted to start talking about how and when he was going to be allowed to use the family car. And his dad was agreeable. Well, yes, when you get your license, of course, we'll work out something. But you're going to have to make some changes. You are now only getting C's, and you're going to have to up those grades to at least a B. And I want you to start reading and really studying the Bible. I don't see you doing that, and I really want that for you. And I'm sorry, but you're going to have to get your hair cut. And the boy was like, Dad. And then he's like, all right, um, I'll consider this. And when Dad said, yeah, I want you to think about it, and we'll talk again sometime. So after six weeks, the boy had improved his grades. He got them up to a B. He got extra credit, and he was working hard, and he got a B. And uh, so he thought, you know, I'm going to approach Dad. And so his father said, you know, I am really pleased with you. I've seen you reading your Bible, um, and I've seen you studying the Bible, and I'm very pleased about that. I I saw that you, I looked online, I see your grades are up. and But, you know, son, I'm, I'm really disappointed. You know, you haven't cut your hair. In fact, it's longer than I saw you last time when we talked about this. And he goes, you know, Dad, I've been thinking about that since I've been reading the Bible. You know, Moses, he had really long hair. And what about Samson? You know, his hair was the key to his power. He's a Nazarite. He wasn't even supposed to cut his hair. He was holy to the Lord. You know, and Jesus... I am sure Jesus had long hair. And his dad said, well, you're, you know, you're right. Um, especially about Samson, his hair was key. He was uh, a Nazarene and set apart for the Lord. And, and yeah, John the Baptist and Jesus, I'm sure, had long hair. I don't dispute that at all. And I just want you to consider their lives a little more closely because you'd have to agree all of them walked everywhere they went. So uh, the boy thought about that. He kind of had a surprised look on his face, and then he kind of thought, you know, maybe I need to get my hair cut. (laughs) He had a change of mind. You know, much of our growth as Christians is determined by how we think, because how we think is how we then behave. How we think matters and affects much of our lives. In fact, I would say it probably thinks all, almost all of our lives. The primary weapon that the devil wants to use against you and I are our thoughts. And of course, our emotions are part of that, but a lot of our emotions come from our thoughts. Now, yes, I'll agree that when you have physical ailments and and other things like that, because we're all one being, that can affect things. But again, our thoughts can affect about our physical ailments. And so as followers of Christ, the Apostle Paul would invite us to take captive our thoughts and make them obedient to Christ. That's what he writes in his letter to the Corinthian church. Take captive your thoughts and make them obedient to Christ. And as you do so, then you'll find that you are becoming an instrument of God that he can use where there is sadness to make a joy-filled life um, by your choosing how you approach things in life and how you approach others in life. When you make something captive and obedient to Christ, 
What you're really doing is making it captive and obedient to love. That's not a hard standard to understand, but somehow we really struggle to implement being more loving. I would say sometimes we uh, rationalize what love might be for someone else and how we're showing love to them when really it's about uh, for ourselves. Now, there's a point of balance, of course. You can't let your needs go completely unaddressed. Um, you, that would be kind of a, a bad mindset to have, too, to ignore your own needs completely. But a lot of what we have in life are not needs. They're really desires or wants. And the world tempts us, the devil certainly tempts us, to put our desires, our wants, uh, before all others. And uh, Jesus says, no, put God above all others. Then God will take care of things, and he'll take care of you. And Jesus modeled uh, that great love that God has for us by laying down his life for us. But it wasn't always easy for Jesus. I don't want you to think, well, while wow, Jesus could do it because he's God, well, he was fully human too, and so he had a struggle. And I want to remind you of the story of the Garden of Gethsemane, the night Jesus was arrested, that he went out and he struggled with, with receiving what God's will was for him because anybody would. When you can, knew how horrible the crucifixion was going to be, he asked that God remove that from him and to find a different way. And he, he struggled so much that the Bible records his struggle was like tears of blood, that he was so upset about that. But in the end, through his struggle, he chose to do not his own human will to avoid pain, of course, like anybody would, but instead to willingly lay down his life for us. And he showed us the greatest love of all by doing so. That his sacrificial giving for us was good for us and for the whole world. He received the sins of the whole world. So I want you to consider that it might not always be easy, but it is always good when we choose to let our thoughts be coming under the control of our Heavenly Father. So when we figure out how to get our thoughts in line with God, then we can remind ourselves that that includes our whole body and our whole being. And then we start living for God in new ways that are surprisingly good. The Apostle Paul wrote this in the chapter right before this chapter in Romans. And if you read Romans, you'll find out that up to 11, the first uh, 11 chapters in Romans is really a treatise on what it means how to become a Christian and what it means to to look like a Christian. And then the last part is how you live it out in your life. And it's a lot harder to live it out. It's hard. I mean, he spent a lot of time talking about what it means to be a Christian. And some of our great uh, basis of how we built our churches, some great theology is in the first part of Romans. And so um, when you read Romans, it can sometimes seem kind of harsh and in fact, um, sometimes when you read the Bible in general, we want you to read the Bible, but when you read the Bible, it can be kind of strong language. Um, some of those arguments are pretty, pretty pervasive. And you might wonder, where is this love if you don't read it carefully? Like me, I often jump down. I, I read the greetings, but I don't really read them as closely as I should because in those greetings, um, it talks about, his grace and his generosity. And in fact, um, Paul's writings were so harsh that sometimes when they met him in person, the different churches thought that he was kind of a weak leader because he was much more kind and much more loving. And so when you read the Bible, you have to look for those loving parts. And, and um, Paul says that, that as he's writing, he concludes with this, the reason we can trust God is this, and let's share this together. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us 
<coughs> to understand his decisions and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Yeah, who knows enough to give God advice? I try to all the time. And who has given him so much? He needs to pay it back. Everything comes from him, exists by his power, and is intended for his glory. Glory to him forever. Amen. And that's Romans 11, 36 through 30, 33 through 36. So I want you to remind yourself, this is who you're worshiping. A God who is beyond us. It'll come back in a minute. It always does. <laughs> we hope today won't be the exception. But here's something. You know, when you think about giving to God... Have you given God so much that he'll need to pay you back? <laughs> no, because everything we have comes from him. And who can know God's thoughts? You know, I, we try to. Can we give God advice? No, but we try to. So when you decide that you might want to start thinking more like God, that's a choice you can make with confidence, that the God you're trusting is so beyond that he will take care of things. Now, Paul also writes in our passage, not only should we give our minds to him, but we should give our bodies. And we know that the Jewish people offered sacrifices to God, animal sacrifices to God, to make themselves right. But as Jesus offered his sacrifice to us, we don't have to do that anymore. That, in fact, because of Jesus, God accepts us as we are right now. And that he embraces us as we are right now. But not to leave us this way. To transform us more and more each day into his image. So we know that our bodies affect our attitudes sometimes. If you're hangry, you know you're tired and hungry. You make you hangry. It affects you. When you... Um, when you have a cold or a flu or an ache, if you have chronic pain, that affects you, of course. And so when you decide that you might want to offer yourself, all of you, to God's mercy, you have to remind yourself God has already received you. Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And it is through Christ that we are made acceptable to God. And so God has already received us, and so now we are God's people. And so we're set aside for that purpose, just like they would set aside an animal to care for him. We're now set aside for God's purposes if we choose to live that way. Because God looks at us through the position of Christ. And we can then choose to be, through our minds, better people than we ever were before. And how can we be better? What makes us better? It's not by um, doing good deeds, although those are a sign of our faith. Good deeds won't make us better. But we become better by being more loving. So I would challenge you to think about what you do in the next week, what you say, and consider, is, am I saying this to benefit the person who's hearing it or for my benefit? Am I doing this to benefit them and bless them or for my benefit? And sometimes it's a little bit of both. But when you notice that, when you see, you'll see the results. Look at how it affects them. Are they better for what you've done in your life with them? Or are they, is that been, was there, was there some pain before they got to that point? We need to challenge ourselves as the body of Christ to use our minds, our words, our bodies to help share God's love and to help God be offered to others. In Christ, you see, we can be complete. We don't have to come from a place of lacking. God has made us whole in Christ. And so out of wholeness, we can then offer a blessing to others. Now, God's will might be a challenge for us to accept in our hearts and minds. 
But we can be confident that God's will is perfect, and he's going to do good things through it. Like we know, Jesus had his own challenges sometimes with God's will. But as we trust God, and as we struggle with God through whatever he's asking us to do, then we can grow more like him. Now, the devil tries to fill your mind with lies. And three of them he likes to use go with stinking. He likes to tell you, you stink. And maybe you've had that thought in yourself, I stink. I stink. You give yourself stink eye when you look in the mirror. You stink. Is that your hair? I can't believe it. (laughs) No, you stink because what? You've said that mean thing that you didn't want to say. You've done that mean thing. Some of a some of a person called it na- negative navel gazing. You're looking at your belly button. You're looking inside negatively. And you see how it can happen. One thing, things are going well. Your boss gives you, commends you for your good work. The project team seems to be working together like they're supposed to. Things are going well. Contract got passed. It looks good. Then all of a sudden, somebody corrects you in a large group meeting in front of everyone. What? And as you look at your team, you can't find any of them. Where are they? What are they doing? It's falling apart before your eyes. You get in a fight at home. You get in an argument. And so Satan lures you into thinking, see, I told you, you stink. You just stink. A little church pastor had an altar call every Sunday, and inevitably, old Pete would come down to have a prayer. And it was the pastor's uh, practice to go down and pray with the people who were at the altar. And every week, Pete would pray the same prayer. He said, Lord, I need you to get the cobwebs out of my life. Each week, Lord, the devil spins those old cobwebs that whip a sin in my life. So please clean out the cobwebs of my life. Every week, same prayer. Well, the pastor kind of had enough of that prayer. So that week, he knelt down, and after Pete prayed, he prayed this prayer. He said, Lord, each week my brother Pete comes to you with these cobwebs in his life, and he asks you to clean them out. Well, Lord, today I come to you and I ask, Lord, that you kill that old spider. You kill that spider who's causing those conflicts. You see, the I stink, I can't do it, that comes from the devil. And we need to ask God more maybe than to simply clear out these cobwebs. Maybe he really needs to get to the root of the problem, whatever it might be. Um those hurt feelings, those thoughts we might have. He, he needs a, we might need to really understand, yeah, sure, we mess up. Yeah, we do stink, but God loves us in Jesus. And it's this great mercy that's shown upon us. He forgives us. He helps us. He helps us overcome. And, and we can, being people who overcome and have highly valued to God, we can change those things. We can squash that spider. We can change our attitudes in our minds. A wise man once wrote that when I was young, I wanted to change the world. I thought it was difficult, and it was. And I, I wasn't very successful, so then I decided I'd change my nation. And then I found I couldn't change the nation, so I began to focus on my town. I thought I, I can change my town, and as I was getting older... That didn't even seem to work. I couldn't even change my town, so I thought, I'm going to change my family. That didn't work. My wife was not appreciative of my efforts. But now that I'm an old man, I realize the only change I can really make is on myself. If a long time ago I had tried to change myself, then I probably could have had an impact on my family. And my family and I could have impacted our town. And our town could have probably impacted our state. And our state could probably impact the nation. And I could impact the world. When we change how we think, we change our lives, and it changes our world. Satan tries to tell us another lie. He tries to tell us 
Not only do you stink, but they stink. You stink. <laughs> That's what he tries to tell us. They stink. And you probably run into people who do stink. I do all the time. I think, man, these people, they stink. Yuck. You give them the stink eye. They stink. And God reminds us, change your thinking. When others stink, that the Bible tells us we are to bear with them and forgive whatever grievances we may have against one another. And that's not easy. We're to forgive because God has forgiven me. And you can say, well, I can't work magic, Pastor. Neither can I. But with God's help, I can do God's will. When people are unlovable, we are to do what God has done for us when we are unlovable. Love them anyway. To the extent it depends on you, love them anyway. Now, that doesn't mean you have to trust them or be their BFF. No. But you can uh, turn around how you do things. Because remember, every time you pick up a hot coal to fling at them, you're the one getting burned. Right? And the last thing uh, when you start thinking that way, so you can, when you think you stink or other people stink, then it can lead to you thinking life stinks. That's the third way the devil works on us. And when that happens, you might find you're not sleeping, you get up at night, and you think, man, life just stinks. And it's easy to see if you listen to the news too much or you just, it's hard, life is hard. But think about when you get up in the middle of the night, why don't you think about your life? Did you get up out of a bed? Do you have pajamas? Is there something keeping things cool that you could open the door and stare at with food in it? <laughs> a refrigerator? <laughs> Those are all blessings that others might not have in our world. In fact, they don't have in our world. So when we open our minds up to the blessing of God, then we can be complete and we can be content. You know, contentment is a gift God can give us. And it's a powerful gift. Because when we feel content, when we feel complete in Christ, then we can do things that seem impossible. We can be courageous. We can be strong. We can be faithful. And it will make us a very different life. That we will start blessing those people around us, really blessing them. And our life will be very different. And the way it will be different will be that it is good. Friends, God's will for you is good. Seek God's will for you and live in that good. Let's pray together.